is I'm just going to put my reading glasses on because it's no. <laughs> boring and I have got slides. <laughs> um, and by the way, uh, Shonavia, um, I would really like to interview you after this, if that's okay. <laughs> um, and if anybody does want to talk to me, I've got my cards on me, so um, sorry, I'm putting my own So, Bismillah, uh, Assalamu Alaikum, Sabatri Akal, Namaste, Ni Hao. Voices, yes, it, we do uh, cover all our ethnic minority communities across the country, uh, which means um, that as a one-person team, um, and the researcher and the journalist, and also having to cut the stories, it's a lot of work. I'm also a, um, a playwright, and um, why create a platform in our mainstream media for our very diverse cultures, like some people, to be able to tell our players their stories, um, it is actually personal for me. And it starts with my family. In this case, uh, on my mother's side, as a Chinese New Zealander, uh, we've been here since 1907. This is my daigong, my great grandfather's poll tax certificate. Uh, he left Canton via Vancouver and arrived here. Uh, in 1907, so I'm a poll tax descendant. Obviously, I'm Eurasian um, because I'm tall and um, have slightly lighter skin. Um, so that yeah, <laughs> also explains the Chiang Mai Earl. Um, so 100 pounds per head. Um, I know uh, that um, you're, many of you will be familiar already with the poll tax history. Well, it was a buried history when I first came across it uh, back in 1995 when I was researching for my play, Gassiu, that is home. Uh, and forgive my Cantonese um, pronunciation, uh, I'm a typical fourth generation New Zealand, um, Chinese New Zealander, and uh, I don't have very much Cantonese. Yamcha Cantonese, I say, I can get my Yamcha. Um, so, so, I, so I started researching for my play and uh, discovered um, the history of the poll tax. Um, and it was my mother who mentioned it to me, but actually it was my friend Esther Fung who explained the appalling history. And I won't, I won't bore you with this history right now, but um, suffice to say that it um, really informed my play. Gus Letters Home premiered in 1996 at Circuit Theatre Wellington. Uh, fictionalised, of course, close to, but very close to the bone, um, based on my own family history, my kōpō uh, and gongong, my Chinese grandparents and um, escaping the Sino-Japanese invasion during the Second World War, my mother uh, and my grandmother being one of the two and a half thousand women and children refugees, um, which is coming up as a, as a special, um, uh, uh, special Richard Leung and uh, Debbie C. Coy are organising um, uh, a very special um, commemoration, commemoration for that. Um, so it's, this play um, is set against um, 100 years of New Zealand and China's history uh, leading up to um, Tiananmen Square in 1989. And um, it brings to mind right now um, pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. Um, so I started off um, in theatre and there are my plays. Ko Shan uh, followed, that's actually Roseanne Liang on the cover. She played the key character. Um, and um, she's Renee's sister, and a wonderfully talented woman. Um, at the time, of course, um, not enough actors around, so that's why people like Jacob Brajan and myself had to perform all five characters on, the, on stage and make it solo. Um, this, uh, these um, plays are now um, they're published in part of NCEA uh, and taught across the country at tertiary and secondary um, uh, institutions, which is fantastic because it means um, that our message is getting across, our, our stories are getting across, and um, now there is a l wonderful large talent, uh, pool of talent of actors and writers um, and, and people like um, Rene uh, Yang as well coming through and um, creating work, so it's wonderful. Um, Man in a Suitcase, my play. Um, premiered in uh, 2012. It was a collaboration with the Court Theatre Christchurch and Peking University, the um, Institute of um, World Theatre and Film. It's a fictionalised drama based on the case of Wang Yao, the Chinese student murdered in 2006 uh, by a fellow Chinese student whose body was infamously dismembered and stuffed into a suitcase. Um, it was, um, my play was given official, official Chinese uh, government sanctioning 
to perform at the Beijing Fringe Festival for two weeks in September 2012. And we had five creatives from China, from Beijing and Chiang Mai, come across to work on this with the, um, the, the um, yes, so we, did, we got it to China, but uh, it was probably shut down and censored very heavily. Um, and um, just <laughs> suffice to say that <laughs> I think the material was, um, so the, the, the sanctioning was obviously rescinded by the Ministry of Culture, uh, and um, so we were not able to um, perform it with the Beijing Fris uh, Fringe Festival. We were not able to sell tickets or talk to the press, and the press could come and see it, but they were not allowed to review it. Um, that's probably about as heavy as you get for censorship. So I experienced firsthand um, the importance of freedom of speech and our democratic right to inquiry here in New Zealand. It's something that we should never take for granted. Um, and also what drives me as a journalist. Having said that though, um, uh, just on this note, um, the, here we go, free, it was free. <laughs> we had three nights. Um, and um, it was full, it was full up with mostly students from Peking University. Um, no hard feelings. Here I am interviewing the Consul General of China, Mr. Niu Qingbao, at Kawe Rua Beach, uh, as part of the Chinese Historical Beacon Trail, Qingmen 2013. And this is, um, uh, was a wonderful um, uh, opportunity as a Punyu descendant. Um, a one-hour documentary that I made uh, covering this very special meeting between Chinese and Māori and uh, 110 years after the sinking of the SS Bindor. And I know you would have heard about that in Rene Yang's play, um, The Bone Feeder, um, which I've also done. Stories about who we are. There's been Foon uh, and Kaumatu with Joseph Adams. Um, it was a really, just a really beautiful um, talk about, you know, getting the communities together 110 years later. Um, and a real privilege to be there as a Punyu and Poltax descendant. As a journalist, I've caught a huge variety of stories. Um, Dr. Shadar Paul is one of them. Um, I haven't put his photograph up here because I know you've met him already and he's spoken to you. But uh, also um, Dr. Sweet Tan, um, both of these men are finalists uh, uh, of New Zealand of the Year Awards. In my opinion, I think both of them should have won. But anyway, um, so. It's good and bad for me. The, the stories cover the good and bad stuff. Um, and so here we are, Shakti Women's Refuge, Auckland. In the year 2009 to 2010, New Zealand experienced over 101,000 incidents of domestic violence. In 2011, over 44% of Shakti's cases, and there are hundreds of ethnic women each year seeking refuge, uh, also reported having experienced forced or forced underage marriage. Culturally motivated and sanctioned crime is my Voices program broadcasting this Monday, the 6th of October. Do check it out. Um, it's, it's focusing part one on forced underage marriage and will be followed by a program about FGM, female genital mutilation, as it affects women and children in New Zealand. I have extensive, extensive interviews with leaders from the Somali community speaking out against FGM and FGM educators that are actually Somalian within um, working within their community. Obstetricians, uh, FGM survivor, Asian liaison police officers and inspector um, Rakesh Naidu um, from the New Zealand Police as well as Judge Ajit Swaran Singh. So these are the people that I've interviewed for this. Um, it's going to be a two-part uh, um, Voices special but also um, in conjunction with um, Insight, our Insight program. Um, now, this is not about stigmatising our ethnic communities. This is about celebrating them, but it's also not, it's about ownership. It's about um, embracing, and I'm just going to sweep through um, some of these, um, kind of the diverse range of stories of the people that I meet, you know. Um, it's absolutely, I, I, I count myself as really privileged. Um, so, Rakesh Naidu, Inspector Rakesh Naidu said, it's not about stigmatising our communities, it's about getting our ethnic communities to speak out and actually uh, uh, empower. So working on that sort of ETU or um, Civica Proud, uh, the White Ribbon campaigns, if we can do the same for our ethnic minority communities. Um, and how do we do that? We do that through the media. Um, so I'm just going to carry on and show you some more images. Here we go, uh, Sergeant Complete Aurora, Manukau County's Police, 
Wonderful. So he's working. He's one of the Asian liaison police officers. Um, this is a recent story I did. So you see incredible diversity. This is why it's called Voices now. So it used to formally be called Asian Report. Um, but you know, what about all our pan-African communities, the MILA, the Middle Eastern and Latin American communities? What about all the other people that need a voice in mainstream media? Um, Hafsa from Sri Lanka chooses to wear niqab. So I asked her why. And um, that was at uh, the mosque open day. 11-year-old Sara al Sanin from Gaza uh, tells me that she's really frightened for her um, grandparents who are currently in the heart of Gaza. Um, and, uh, and so on. that's my favourite photograph, by the way. This is um, 78 year old Duncan Sue Hoy, Debbie's um, uncle, uh, interviewing me. So it's about putting you know, the power back to the people, dem democratising mainstream media. But look, uh, very importantly, too, I, did, uh, um, I have covered uh, our Muslim communities, um, wanting to know um, how they feel uh, right now about events um, happening in Gaza or. Uh, about issues like um, the Islamic State, what are their thoughts? Um, so I have interviews um, with um, Dr. Anwar Ugani, which I would recommend you check out too. So go to the Radio News and the website, look under Voices. Um, one of the key things here is that radicalization and fundamentalism only comes out of ghettoization of communities. So this is coming back to buried histories and this is coming back to people managing stigma, ethnic groups managing stigma. And that's, that's why it's personal, personal for me because um, I understand that um, from my own family background. Um, mainstream media must recognise this. Currently Voices is the only non-commercial public broadcast uh, um, platform um, in New Zealand because Asia Down Under uh, no longer exists and we don't have a weekly um, voice. Um, so that's not good enough as far as I'm concerned. Uh, let's make a change there. Thank you.